pode falar sobre Seattle logo de cara, assim, que tem três Seattles diferentes. Primeiro, downtown, prédios gigantescos, muitos business, negócio, dinheiro rolando, indústrias também, porto, né, quer dizer, sempre rola grana mesmo. A segunda Seattle a gente já pode considerar natureza, por exemplo, tem lá no fundão, assim, Monte Rainier, um monte nevado maravilhoso, lagos, temos florestas, parques ecológicos, muita natureza mesmo em Seattle. E a terceira Seattle que a gente já conhece, é o que interessa pra gente, é a Seattle musical. Muita música mesmo, não é papo furado aquele papo. Seattle Sound, Seattle não sei, existe mesmo muitos nightclubs. A gente vai estar cobrindo alguns nightclubs, mostrando algumas entrevistas exclusivas pra você. É só aguardar, Gastão cobre Seattle. Seattle fica localizada no extremo noroeste dos Estados Unidos, pertinho da fronteira com o Canadá. No estado de Washington, que não tem nada a ver com a capital dos Estados Unidos, que é Washington DC, fica lá na costa leste, certo? Bom, é cercado por água, aqui é uma baía, então onde você olhar tem o mar ou tem lago, tem muita água mesmo ao redor. É que as pessoas adoram cerveja, principalmente cerveja local. Ele vai protecionismo, né? Ah, cerveja nossa é melhor, bebem cerveja o dia inteiro e café também, café é um dos grandes vícios da população daqui. Outro vício também é a música, né? Como o tempo é meio ruim, chove bastante, o pessoal fica a maior parte do tempo então em garagens, ou ouvindo ou tocando, e essa é a razão porque tem tantas bandas boas em Seattle. A Sub Pop, aquele selo né, famosíssimo, foi um dos grandes responsáveis pela explosão de música em Seattle mesmo. Com isso, né, com toda essa explosão musical, aqui realmente tem um dos catálogos mais bem servidos de música alternativa nos Estados Unidos. Isso referente às lojas de música. O que a gente vai fazer agora é a gente vai visitar uma loja de disco, você vai ver só o que tem de coisa boa. Só conferir. Temos aqui então a Tower Records de Seattle, uma das lojas que tem o maior catálogo de música alternativa. E aqui ao meu lado, Bob, que é o manager, o gerente da loja, a gente vai conversar um pouquinho sobre Grunge Ears. Shall we? This, this band right here, Heat Miser, they're from uh, Oregon, they're getting a, an awful lot of press and a lot of people are really excited about them right now. Oh, um, this, they're from Oregon and they are considered like local bands as well? Yeah, anything in the Northwest, is, once you cross the California line, we don't count it anymore, but uh, Oregon, uh, Washington, you know, Vancouver. Pretty much considered the Northwest. How, how was this section like five years ago? There um, was there so many local bands. We had about two rows, and then each year we'd expand like two or three rows, and then three or four, and now we're up to you know we've got three full racks, probably about uh, 28 or 30 rows now. So we have no idea what that means. Like that, that's a, it's a foreign word here. Just, People who aren't from Seattle and from the Northwest use the term grunge, but uh, yeah, around here it doesn't mean too much. Why do you think that they use this, they insist in using this? Uh, it's, it's an easy tag, it's like using the word alternative or disco or uh, heavy metal. I mean, you know, they're, they're just tags for people who don't really understand the music. We had a lot of fun um, 
A lot of our shows were big events because that was right about the time that uh, ecstasy started hitting the town and uh, rave parties. Or what yeah, uh, our shows were more like raves, you know, back in the mid '80s. And uh, when was about when was it that? It, you know, about '85, '86. You know, we had played a lot of warehouse shows where uh, you know everyone was really high, and uh, we had a light show. Uh, one of the guys, the guy who did our light show, used to do light shows back at the Fillmore West in San Francisco. So uh, we had a lot of fun. It was very visual. All the senses were attacked at the same time, you know. Everybody who was a musician in Seattle had a day job also. No one was supporting themselves making music. What were you doing then? I was working at Muzak <laughs> with uh, a lot of the other people, uh, the sub pop people, you know, um, Bruce Pavitt, Mark Arm, Tad, Grant from The Walkabouts, a lot of the people. We all worked at Muzak and uh, we all worked full time and then we played, you know, shows and. Uh, worked hard at trying to, to, to make a living at, at Muzak. Music, I should say, not Muzak, because we were making a living at Muzak. I've been um, in Seattle all my life, and uh, you know, five years ago or so, everybody knew each other in Seattle. You'd go to a show and everybody knew each other. Um, Bruce was my roommate. Um, a roommate. Yeah, and we shared an apartment with Bruce's girlfriend, and uh, our we needed a new bass player, and so I asked Bruce, who was my roommate at the time, and he said yes, and so he's our new bass player. Uh, not because he was in you know Mother Love Bone or Green River, which were great bands, but because he's our friend. The name of the record is called Far Gone, and it will be out in July on Sub Pop Records. The greatest thing about Seattle is that all the bands are not trying to be the same. I think everyone's trying to be different, and uh, we're trying to be different. And I, I think we can, I think we can do well as far as like. Uh, we, we do have possibility of crossing into the commercial market, so to speak, you know what I mean? Tem muitas bandas também que tocam por aqui, tem show praticamente toda noite, tem muitos nightclubs, você vai andar por aí, você vai ver, tem show de tudo quanto é tipo. Por exemplo, estivemos aí no show de George Clinton, um dos maiores fenômenos da música, o criador do funk praticamente, aquela mistura de funk com música psicodélica. Ele tem uma banda chamada P-Funkadelic All Stars. Ele esteve lá no show, conferiu e conversou com George Clinton, figuraça, maior figura mesmo. 52 anos, muita energia ainda no palco, o show durou mais ou menos 3 horas e meia, conferindo agora uma entrevista histórica com o Mr. George Clinton. <música> About psychedelic music nowadays, that you were the first ones to join funk music and psychedelic music, and now everybody's talking about psychedelic music. Well, we, we knew that if we did it and then waited around for it to catch back up with us, that it would work because we watched BB King in 1969 get his first award. I think it was about 40 years old. He said, "What the hell? We ain't got to be in no hurry then, because it was hard as hell keeping up with the Temptations and the Pips and all those groups." So we said, "Well, okay." Since rock and roll was just beginning, you know, and blues was hip. So that's the same shit my mother and used to listen to. It. So if that's hip now, so probably rhythm and blues with a little speed to a little groove to it, probably hip in a few years too. So we just did that and took funk as the name and made it kind of, you know, psychedelic. We 
saw with rock and roll, we saw what the white kids was getting away with. We said, see it. We really know how to do that shit because you know, we've been down south all that before. We knew what patches and jeans meant. We knew how to you know, do that for good. So we got real crazy with the costumes. And, matter of fact, we got silly. <laughs> emotion feeling for almost four hours on stage. Well, the first two and a half hours for the people. Second, the last hour and a half is for us. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not. Go ahead. It's not that kind of strict concert that you have everything you rehearse. Are you? Oh no. Are we in trouble all the time? Because we don't never know what the hell we're doing. You know, what I mean, that's why I'm like the referee. We, I mean, we have a sketchy, but it's so easy to call. I'll change song right in the middle of the show, and somebody don't hear you. And all those things to us is like the fun part of it because it gets so boring after all these years. And if you're real good, you're creative when you find out, oh shit, I'm in the wrong song. And if you're real good, you can just improvise like I knew this. And... Well, you're kind of godfather of one of the most popular bands nowadays that's Red Hot Chili Peppers and produce some albums. What do you think about that? I think my boy, I my boy, you know, I got him out to the farm where I live when the first you know, asked me to do the record. And I said, okay, good, because I was glad, you know, I had always thought that the first white funk band was going to come from Europe the same way they did with the blues bands. And they saw in the, one of the trade magazines that I had said that they came right up on the stage someday, but what do you mean the first white band is going to come from Europe? We're from here, we're going to be... Yeah. So they came to my house and stayed about a month and we rehearsed. And they took Anthony fishing every day. And um and they are fun. I mean they taught us our own songs. When we did this um the Grammys, for three days that we rehearsed for that Grammy show, they taught us songs of ours that we hadn't played in 15 years. As the wind blew, you hear them pepper take slip. You just follow his nose. Oh Mac Popco had some drugs. -I -I That's the way we are. We just, we'd rather just go on in and do the show. You start out doing it in the gym and in the in the little small clubs and places like that. So you should always be able to do that. You know, to, then you don't have those he extra headaches of uh, worrying about how the show should have been because the reality is how it was. If, if that's the way it is. That's the hard you can do. So I mean, funk is like do the best you can and funk it with a smile on your face. Yeah, I mean, you do the best you can. It really ain't in your hands no more. U.S. custom coast guard dope dog, big name bus. Like most dope sniffing dogs, gotta have it. Train to have that. Pick up the tracks of the traffic of the traffic like a rabbit up the coastline. Chris Murphy and I play the bass and I sing some of them. I'm Jay Ferguson and I play guitar and I sing sometimes. Patrick and I play guitar. I'm Andrew and I play the drums and the trombone. I can't tell you. Canada, there's lots of different bands in small towns that you'd never think of just because they don't have exposure, and that's the same thing with Halifax. There's never uh, been any media or, you know, nobody knows about them, but now as a result of us, we sort of got out and now we can tour and put out records, and now there's other bands from the area who've gotten to tour and put out records now too. I kind of forget what I wrote, but I wrote um, this article called Uh, Canada, the music ghetto of the world. And because Canada is often thought of as being this backward sort of little brother of the states, sort of, um, okay, well, it's been out for four years in, in, uh, in the states, so let's jump on it now. It's like way behind the time, sort of like uh, Loverboy and uh, all these embarrassing bands. You know, the big <laughs> band in, in, in Canada is Brian Adams, so you're playing in Germany, and they go, Brian Adams. And you're like, look, I have to explain, no, that's wrong. You told me that you are touring with Slime Hats. 
the East Coast. How was that? It was really, really good. We played, uh, I don't know, three weeks of shows. Or like we didn't have to worry about crowds or anything. There was always a thousand or more people there, and uh, it was just kind of spoiling for a while. Like, you know, we come our first tour of the United States. We have so many songs because we recorded this record that's out a year and a half ago. So we have all these new songs, we want to record them, but we probably won't be able to record them until the end of this year. What we'd like to do is two EPs per year, but yeah. I don't think we're allowed. Okay. Singles, like the 60s, you could put out two or three albums a year. It was cool. The right? Beatles had two records. I mean, it's a drag after a while if you had to put out records. <laughs> you need a record in a week. <laughs> Get writing. Vamos ficando por aqui, amanhã tem muito mais Gastão Cobre Seattle, amanhã tem uma entrevista exclusiva com Daniel House. O cara primeiro, já tocou no Skin Yard, trabalhou na Sub Pop e tem a CZ Records, ele é o proprietário, um dos seus mais promissores ao lado da Sub Pop aqui de Seattle. Inclusive, na semana a gente vai ver muitos videoclipes exclusivos, bandas que você nunca ouviu falar assim, ah, que banda é essa? Você vai ver exclusivamente, e são bandas promissoras, de repente você vai ouvir falar muito, como por exemplo, Three People, é só aguardar, amanhã tem mais. O que a gente vai ver hoje nesse programa vai ser a CZ Records. CZ Records é uma das gravadoras mais importantes de Seattle, para você ter uma ideia. Em 86, eles lançaram Deep Six, que era uma coletânea que tinha Soundgarden, Melvins, Malfunction, que era a banda do Andrew Wood, Mother Love Bone. É só essas bandas mesmo, quer dizer, ninguém conhecia ainda o som de Seattle, ele já tinha investido nisso. O proprietário da CZ Records é um cara muito gente boa, chamado Daniel House. Ele é baixista, trabalhou na Sub Pop e tocou o baixo no Skin Yard, uma bandaça de Seattle. Conferindo agora, então, Daniel House e a sua CZ Records. CZ Records, os melhores selos de Seattle, e a gente tá aqui entrando... Bom, vem, vem comigo, vem comigo aqui. Bom, o dono desse selo é Daniel House, o cara era baixista do Skin Yard, também um grande produtor, já produziu um monte de banda, a gente vai mostrar o catálogo. Esse aqui é o escritório deles, assim, momentaneamente, porque eles estão se mudando em duas semanas para um escritório bem maior, como ele próprio falou. Ele tá preocupado, aí falou, poxa, tá uma bagunça aqui. Mas quem se importa com bagunça? Quem interessa é o som. You are, you are the owner of this label for many years and you used to play in skin art as well how do you how do you manage that uh well it was it was difficult i actually worked uh i ran my label i worked at sub pop and i was in skin yard all at the same time and uh it was kind of like being a juggler most of the time um it finally got to a point where i had to make choices in, in terms of what i wanted to do and what i didn't want to do and uh So I've, after six and a half years, I quit playing in Skin Yard, and uh, I left Sub Pop after two and a half years, and put all my time in, into this. Skin Yard was around for six and a half years when I quit, and uh, I think it was a lot of hard work, and I think we were very much ahead of what was going on in Seattle. I think, I think we just got tired of working so hard for so many years, and we finally just had to move on and do different things. You know, I think. I think had the band started two or three years later, uh, we could have been really big, but... Why do you think that you didn't become really big? I just think we were doing something before everybody was ready for it. Right. We felt the need to do other things. I mean, you know, Barrett is now in Screaming Trees, and, and Jack is doing his production thing, and I'm doing this, and this takes up all of my time. Ben is in Grunt Truck. And Ben is in Grunt Truck, and uh, 
Everybody seems to be doing better now with what they're doing than any of us were doing in all the time that we were together in Skin Yard. I mean, we were a hard-working band, but people seem to think that since we had other interests as well, that, that Skin Yard, we were never serious about that. And that was just, that was never the case. We were, you know, we were always very serious about it and worked hard. And, and back then, in the early days, we toured more than most of the bands in the area. And we always did better outside of Seattle than we did here in Seattle. Actually, originally, I started the band with Jack, and I, I sought him out because I'd been in two bands previous. Let me get this. They left. Um, I was in two bands before Skin Yard. One was called Ten Minute Warning, and uh, people from Ten Minute Warning was Duff McKeegan, who went on to Guns N' Roses, and Greg Gilmore, who ended up going on to be the drummer of uh, Mother Love Bone. And then I was in another band at the same time that was an all-instrumental sort of progressive rock band. We were called Feedback. And that was uh, me with a drummer, Matt Cameron, who's now in Soundgarden. And uh, both bands broke up, and I kind of wanted to start a band that was ultimately the combination of both. And uh, I had met Jack through Feedback, because he was friends with the guitarist in that band. And, uh, he had played, brought in a bunch of his tapes of him playing everything. and so. I found, you know, after the bands broke up, I sought him out, and we uh, we finally started getting together and working on a band, and just kind of came together from there. I'd like to show the legacy. Okay. <laughs> Under protest. Here's the here's the Skinyard legacy. This is uh, our first release, just titled Skinyard. Um, it was the third release on CZ Records. Um, it has since been licensed to Cruise Records in Los Angeles. This is our second record, many people's favorite. It's called Hallowed Ground, and it came out on uh, uh, Toxic Shock Records um, in Arizona. That contract will be up this June, and uh, we don't know who's going to be reissuing it, but maybe it'll be Cruise, maybe it'll be CZ. I don't know. This is our third record, personally, my least favorite. My least favorite, many people's favorite. Who knows? Uh, it's called This Size Chunks. I know I can't probably say it in the air. We'll just show it to you. We'll let it speak for itself. This is the last record I did with the band, and it's called 1000 Smiling Knuckles. Personally, this is my favorite record. I think it's the best performances that we ever did in the studio. I think it's the best songwriting. Um, I think this is our most cohesive record. After this year. You quit the band. I was just tired of it. I had uh, the best record. Well, I didn't think we could do a better one. What what better time to leave than after our best record? Yes. Oh. Nineteen eighty-two through nineteen eighty-five. Were there many bands at that time, or...? Not really, no. There was, at the time, the biggest bands were 10 Minute Warning and a band called The U-Men. Yeah, and, uh, pretty much at the tail end of those bands, Malfunction and Soundgarden and uh, The Melvins all started up. And then Skin Yard started up around the same time. Um, and pretty much at that time, you had the, the whole new family of bands, and you had, you had Soundgarden and the Melvins and Malfunction. And, you know. How do you call family? Like, um, they used to help each other and this kind of thing? Oh yeah, we all, all used to play together. Because uh, back then there, weren't, there were not 5,000 bands, it was, you know, a dozen or two dozen bands playing around. And back then you didn't have the same audience. You didn't have a, a, a lot of people going to shows. You know? How do you think that's kind of competition? It wasn't as competitive, no. It would, all the bands would go see all the other bands and, and all their friends and all their girlfriends. And, but nowadays? And nowadays it's ridiculous. You said that there is like there are about 5,000 bands. All, are, all of them are from Seattle or they are from different parts from, of the United States? I mean in Seattle. I don't know if it's 5,000. I'm just using a number. But there's, there's a lot of bands here now and there's a lot of competition because Seattle's a big deal now and everybody wants to get signed. CZ Records was actually around before Sub Pop was. The first release was called Deep Six, and uh, that had the first Soundgarden, the first Skinyard, the first Green River, the first Melvins. 
Uh, that release predated Sub Pop as a record label. Um, when Sub Pop started, they were very serious as being a business. When CZ started, it was kind of more of a hobby for a long time. And it was actually while I was at Sub Pop that I decided I should get more serious about it and started putting out more and more records. Yeah, actually, A&M Records is going to be putting it out. Um, we just figured that we couldn't, because of our size as a label, we couldn't move enough units of that record, so we decided that we might want to license it to a major label. And uh, we get points on it, so it's sort of a, it's an A&M CZ co-release. Which bands do you, are you releasing now? Uh, uh, Seven Year Bitch, Tree People, uh, Gnome. There's a new band called Engine Kid. There's a new band called Dirt Fisherman. All in all, we have 12 bands. We've got a lot to work with. We also have a band called uh, Gits, um, Alcohol Funny Car, and Gnome. How do you do to choose these bands to put in, in the label? Like you get some tapes, some demo tapes, and then you. You choose these? Mostly I see them and I hear them. Um, we get a lot of demo tapes, but most of the time we don't sign a band because we hear a tape. We have to see the band and we have to kind of be more involved you know, in actually meeting them, talking to them, seeing them live, seeing how they work off of an audience. Um, we don't have any guidelines as far as we want a band that sounds like this. Either it, it works or it doesn't for whatever reason. CZ Records has a particular feel, I think, but I don't think they have a particular sound. I, I generally prefer bands that, that really have their own sound, that don't sound like another band, because if they sound like another band, why not just work with the other band? Uh, the new Nirvana has already come and gone, and uh, they're called New Kids on the Block. Sub Pop helps you anyway, or you don't have any relation with Sub Pop now? We're friends. Yeah, we give them our CDs and they give us ours. And we listen to each other's music and I think we appreciate each other. Se você ligou seu televisor agora, isso aqui é Pioneer Square em Seattle. Era um antigo centro de Seattle, né? Quando a cidade pegou fogo e tal, já aconteceu essa história. E o que a gente tá vendo aqui é exatamente The Central, um dos bares onde algumas bandas começaram. Por exemplo, Soundgarden, Nirvana, Green River, só banda. Hoje em dia mudou um pouquinho o som, já não toca mais isso. Olha só, blues extravaganza, alguns músicos que eu nunca ouvi falar, quer dizer, mudou bastante aqui. O que a gente tá acompanhando nesse programa, então, é CZ Records, Mr. Daniel House vai contar um pouquinho mais sobre essa selo importantíssimo em Seattle, se bobear tão importante quanto a Sub Pop, conferindo Daniel House. This is the first release ever by the Melvins, who, well, if you don't know who the Melvins are by now, you should quit collecting music and take up stamp collecting. When, when was recorded? Out originally in 1986, and about a year and a half ago we released the CD with all 10 songs. Originally we put out a 7-inch, and that was six songs, and this was actually the full 10 songs that was recorded in the original recording session. Alcohol Funny Car is a band you'll be hearing a lot from soon. Uh, they're a three-piece. They play very loud, direct, in-your-face, punchy, punk pop. And, uh, what can I say? Trio. You'll be, you'll be, they're a trio. You'll be hearing a lot from them. It's, uh, it's kind of a Minneapolis thing, but they'd probably have my head if they heard me say that. Uh, this is Gnome. They're uh, a band that's currently getting a lot of interest. Uh, they're a very, very catchy kind of power pop band. Um, they've been compared to bands like Cheap Trick, uh, Buzzcocks, even T-Rex. I think they're a lot punchier than, huh? Kind of. I just think of them as, as really good songwriters with a really powerful live show. Bitch. There we go. I, I, I am sure by now you've, you've heard of Seven Year Bitch. I certainly hope so. Um, they're Seattle's premier all-woman punk rock 
band. They are not Riot Girls, as people like to call them. They are oh, people. They're feminists, certainly, but they're not Riot Girls. Um, they're very visceral, very idealistic. Who died in the band? Um, Stephanie here is the one who died. Um, she was an old, old good friend of mine. Um, the press typically wants to say that it was a heroin overdose. For the record, I'd like to say that it was not. It was heroin related, but I really think it was a lot more alcohol related. And uh, what did she? She was to do in the band. She was guitar player. It's, it's a really unfortunate thing. She was really a, a wonderful person. Um, Dirt Fisherman currently one of my favorite bands on the label. Two men, two women play really great, uh, oh, once again, power pop, real good vocal harmonies. Um, they will probably get some comparisons to the Breeders. They'll probably get some comparisons to Belly. I think they're just as good. I don't think they will sound good. Check them out for yourself. The Gits, probably one of the most powerful live Seattle bands. Um, Real strong punk rock with real strong, almost bluesy female vocals. Um, very uncompromising, very idealistic. A, a force to be reckoned with. Tree people. Tree people. <laughs> okay, right again. Tree people. Um, these are the last two releases by the Tree People. Um, they're originally from Boise, Idaho. They relocated here. They've uh, gone through a pretty Good spell of, of rocky areas and then finally come out on top. They're on tour right now. Pretty gear shift. That's the case. Um, these guys are originally from the Midwest and relocated here about a year and a half ago. Um, they're, they get a lot of praise and they get a lot of criticism for being too much, too 70s. Um, I think the fact that they're so 70s is what makes them so great. They're a trio also. They're uh, very forceful. They're probably a little too edgy to really be considered 270s. Um, they, they take some of the best aspects of, of 70s hard rock with some of the better aspects of punk metal, I suppose. Um, do something that's really pretty, pretty unique. I do think that the whole grunge scene is kind of on its way out. I think there's uh, a lot more pop going on than ever before. Um, I think there's still a lot of great talent. I think there's still a lot of great bands. And uh, Seattle is in a, in a state of change. Um, hopefully, a change for the better. There's still a lot of great music coming from there. Well, I, I think it's still alternative. Um, it just has, it's still guitars. It's just more pop, there's more tunefulness, there's more melody. I mean, if you really think about it, Nirvana is not a grunge band. Nirvana is a pop band. You know, you, you hear their songs and within two days you're waking up in the morning singing their songs at the top of your lungs in the shower. To me, that's what a pop band is. And to me, Nirvana is what a pop band is. And considering that they are probably the biggest thing that's ever come out of this scene, they are having an incredible influence, or at least, or at least they're making it, they're making it cool or acceptable to be able to play hard rock and be catchy and be poppy. I hope that we can put out uh, consistently good music. I'm hoping that we can uh, become bigger. Obviously, we want to make money. We want to sell records, but we want to do it on our terms. Um, we don't want to be co-opted by a major label. We would certainly like to be recognized for being a label that puts out consistent quality music by, by quality bands. Vamos ficando aqui então nesse segundo dia de Gastão Cobre Seattle. Amanhã tem muito mais para você. Pode ter certeza. Exclusividades, novidades.